Well, Paul Hirsch, thank you for talking to me today. You've got a very impressive resume. Of course, Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back is going to stick out for a lot of people. But I'm wondering, how did you uh, first meet Brian De Palma, since Hi Mom is your first credit? I met Brian through my brother Charles, who had um, gotten a job at Universal Studios in New York City as a scout for writing and directing talent. And I think that the studio never really intended to look for any talent, but they needed a lightning rod to deflect attention away from them. So they hired my brother to uh, talk to people who came to the studio with um, projects in mind. They were looking for you know, financial support. And one of the um, filmmakers in New York who came to the Universal looking for financing was Brian De Palma. And my brother and he proposed a project that the studio rejected. So um, my, uh, my brother had a two-week vacation coming to him, and he raised, I think it was about $36,000 from um, friends and family. And they shot a film during this two-week vacation. That picture was called Greetings, and one of the leads, there were three main characters, and one of the three main characters was a young Robert De Niro. And I had started out cutting trailers at that point. When they needed a trailer for the film, they came to me, and Brian liked my work, and we hit it off. And uh, the picture came out. It was a sort of a mild success, and they got the financing to do a sequel to the film, originally titled Son of Greetings. Um, but they uh, they changed the title during the course of post and is known today as Hi Mom. Brian and I had both been, uh, we are both graduates of Columbia University, so there was a kind of um, shared, uh, you know, shared background there. And uh, we just, chemistry-wise, we just hit it off. That's great. Yeah, and of course, those uh, those. De Niro, Brian De Palma movies are available on Blu-ray now, and they're lots of fun. Uh, and, of course, you worked with him many, many times. And I'm wondering how the relationship evolved from Hi Mom to Mission to Mars. Well, I like to tell people that uh, my relationship with Brian is sort of like a movie run in reverse. We started out almost as brothers, and then we became friends, and then we became colleagues, and then we became acquaintances, and we wound up as strangers. <laughs> But uh, in fact, uh, I've you know had contact with Brian in the last year, and uh, it was a very warm and happy reunion. And I'm happy to say that we are we are communicating again. He wrote me a very nice blurb for my book, which is not something that he is given to do for for many people. I don't know that he's ever done it before, actually. So uh, our, our we are back in good standing. Good. I'm glad to hear that. So yes. Um, I got to meet George Romero a few weeks before he passed, and I uh, thought he was a very warm man, and uh, I was wondering, did you enjoy working on Creepshow? Yeah, well, my contact with George was very brief. I mean, first of all, Creepshow was uh, composed of, um, I forget, it was five or six short episodes, and I only did one of them. Um, the Crate. The Crate, yeah, with uh, Hal Holbrook and Fritz Weaver and Adrian Barbeau. Mm -hmm. And um, um, I flew out to Pittsburgh. I, I told Richard Rubenstein, who was the producer of the film, that you know I'd be happy to do it, but I didn't want to fly to Pittsburgh. I didn't want to leave my wife and small child. So um, they agreed that I could work in New York. And um, so I flew out to Pittsburgh just to meet you know, George, and I discovered that to my surprise, I knew his wife from um, a few years earlier when I first started out uh, in the trailer business. Um, I was working with a uh, fellow named Chuck Workman who was, um, who had started, he had, he had been employed by the same guy I was working for, and then he started a company on his own. And the uh, receptionist at his new company was Christine, who uh, I forget her maiden name, but uh, she married George. And I hadn't known that. So uh, I flew out to Pittsburgh and I saw her there. And, I, and oh, my goodness, you know, what a, what a small world. 
And uh, it turned out that Christine was the inspiration for Stephen King's uh, naming the car in his novel, Christine, after her. <laughs> anyway, I went out to Pittsburgh to meet George, and he was very warm, sort of a big bear of a man, you know, uh, very warm presence. And uh, we didn't have much to say. He just well, I said, welcome aboard. And I said, great. You know, and I, um, I watched the shooting for a little while. I was there the day they were shooting. Um, or they had just shot, I forget, uh, but it was this, the sequence with E.G. Marshall when he's uh, playing a billionaire neat freak and germaphobe who's, um, <laughs> he winds up being overrun by cockroaches. And they had sent crews down to the Caribbean and looked in, in uh, caves filled with bat guano and found the most uh, the largest and most scary looking cockroaches on earth, I think, and uh, uh, brought them back. I don't think the, uh, I don't think customs knew that they brought them back. But anyway, uh, they had all these cockroaches and the crew were all wearing plastic bags over their shoes with their pants tucked into their socks so nothing could run up their leg, you know. So, and they were walking around the set with these plastic bags wrapped down their shoes. And uh, it was winter in Pittsburgh at the time. And I said, well, you know, how do you, how do you round up the roaches after a shot? He said, we don't, you know, we, we assume the winter is going to take care of that. So there may be some uh, freak cockroaches running around the Pittsburgh area for all I know. Whoa. Is there a uh, general general way you would describe people in Hollywood? People in Hollywood? Yes. Well, I don't think so. I mean, there's all sorts of people in Hollywood. Um, you know, I would, there are two groups that I think of people here uh, as belonging to one or the other. One are the people who actually make the movies, and the others are the people who buy and sell the people who make the movies. Mm. So... Um, I, you know, I consider myself part of the former group, and uh, it's the latter group that has all the power, of course. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, do you sit in awe? Do you just kind of like sit in, in basket glory that you had a role in making Star Wars, or are you more nonchalant about it? Well, it was an incredibly uh, fortunate stroke of luck. I mean, um, no, I don't take it for granted at all. I mean... Um, yeah, it's quite remarkable. And it, and it happened to me so early in my career that it, it shaped my entire life. I mean, from then on, I was known as, you know, he worked on Star Wars, that kind of thing. So, yeah. uh, and it came just as my daughter was born. I mean, my life would have been so much different if some of the flops I worked on later in my <laughs> career had been the ones I worked on early in my career. So, uh, I don't, yeah, I'm very, uh, grateful and cognizant of what a what a stroke of good fortune that was may you give us some insight as to what george lucas was like back in the late 70s well george was a very serious guy he had uh he had the the singular quality of being extraordinarily gifted artistically with a fantastic imagination uh, combined with a, an extremely hard-headed business sense. He was a, as a strong a businessman as he was a creative artist, and it's a very rare combination, perhaps unique. Um, and he was a very serious guy. He had, well, I met him uh, when he was in the planning stages of Star Wars, and uh, very briefly, and... I saw him again after completion of principal photography when he and Marsha came back from the UK through New York and uh, Brian and I screened uh, Carrie for them and then they continued on their way back to the West Coast and a couple of weeks later I got a phone call from Marsha saying uh, we need help can you can you come out to San Francisco when Carrie is done and help us and I said sure absolutely and uh, a little more complicated th than that, but I, I get into the details of it in my 
book, which came out last week, is called A Long Time Ago in a Cutting Room Far, Far Away. <laughs> and um, how exactly that worked out is, is detailed in the book. But um, yeah, I joined the crew. Richard uh, Chu was on the picture along with Marsha. And the three of us worked together for um, three months, October, November, December of 76. And then at the end of the year, I'd been hired through the end of the year. And uh, around that time, Marty Scorsese was shooting, it was actually, he was cutting by then. He was cutting his picture, New York, New York, with De Niro and Liza Minnelli. And his editor died. And he called Marsha and asked if she could come on and take over. Uh, and George had decided that he wanted to continue the picture with just one editor at that point. And Marsha came to talk to me and said, I'm going to go work for Marty. And, um, and he told me that George only wanted to work with one editor. And I was expecting her to say, you know, so thank you very much and goodbye and good luck. <laughs> but to my, to my surprise, she said, George wants it to be you. I had thought that Richard had been, since he had been hired before me, I thought he had, uh, he was going to be the one to stay on. But um, apparently he had been offered the same, you know, he was hired on the same basis as I was through the end of the year. So uh, George asked me to stay and I did. So for the, the next five months, I was the editor of the picture. Wow. That's incredible. Uh, and then, of course, there's so many like conventions that are focused around Star Wars. And I was wondering, do you do any of those? Um. Only if I'm invited, but I haven't been invited. Oh, well, maybe with the book that'll that'll change. That should change because those are great stories. Um, so okay, so we're talking about some very interesting characters in Hollywood, such as Brian De Palma, uh, George Romero, and George Lucas. Uh, are are Hollywood directors though? Could, could they ever? Are they ever bullies? Are they uh, when, when they don't have when they aren't as you know talented as those guys? Do, do they ever lash out on you as the editor? Well, I decided when I wrote the book that there's no whining on the yacht. Okay, you know? okay. That's nice. I, That's nice. I've, been so, I've been so fortunate in my career and I've worked on so many uh, great pictures with really talented people that uh, I was not going to deal with, uh, you know, have I been, have I been, uh, have people been rude to me? Yes. Have they treated me insensitively, yes, you know, but I don't want to talk about that because, like I say, when you've had the success that I've had, nobody wants to hear me complaining that oh, this guy didn't listen to me or I didn't agree with this guy or, you know, mm. so um, there's no there's no point in that. I have enough uh, happy stories and, or interesting stories uh, without complaining and moaning and groaning about somebody who didn't behave properly. That's very nice to hear, and I try to uh, act the same way. You know, there's, there's, if if you're grateful and happy, there's no reason to uh, complain so much like that. Uh, I was wondering, did did you ever uh, consider directing or writing yourself? I did. I I was interested in directing for a while, and I when I worked uh, for Joe Roth at 20th Century Fox, there was a move. You know, there was a plan to uh, have me direct one of John Hughes's scripts. But uh, circumstances uh, changed and the fever broke and I gave up on the idea. I mean, um, the thing is, uh, the, the job of editor is, is something I'm much more suited to because I like to keep busy. And uh, as an editor, I can go from project to project. And when you're a director, you have to sort of, it's like you're running for office for the rest of your life. You have to <laughs> you know, uh, get people on board what you want to do and um and you have to deal with a lot of different difficult personalities as the editor you only have to deal with a, one or two difficult personalities at a time so uh it's something i'm much more suited to and i think although you know it would have been nice but are you a bit of a solitary man you like to work alone i do i uh yes i'm i would say you know, for some people, being around other people um, pumps them up. Yeah. And for me, it sort of exhausts me. It's the opposite, you know. So uh, there are those who gain energy from from being around lots of people. And I find that it, it saps mine rather, you know. So I'm very happy to be um, 
in a room by myself focused on a, a particular project. When I started writing the book, it was similar to that. I was able to, uh, to focus on what was right in front of me. Now, after the book has come out, I'm being asked to do interviews. I'm having to schedule talks with various people, and uh, I have to get back to this one. I have to call this one, and there's like a lot of little notes on my desk of things that I have to do, and I feel kind of scattered with all this kind of, you know, it yeah, keeps, uh, keeps me busy. It's a different kind of busy, though. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, I like to focus on something and bear down on it, but... Uh, uh, but you know it's fine. I, I'm enjoying the attention. I know it's not going to last very long. Yeah, you're in variety. You're you're, you're all over the place right now. Uh, how how long did it take you to write your book? Well, I didn't write it all at once. Obviously, I mean, um, I started writing it around. I thought it was 2000, but I think now it was 1999. I was on location in Vancouver, and my wife Jane hadn't accompanied me. And on the weekends, I was alone and kind of bored. And I had been uh, hanging out on the set, uh, swapping stories with people. And I thought, you know, I should really write my stories down. Uh, I really wasn't thinking of a book at that point, but just kind of ma making a record of, um, you know, things that had happened. Because um, I've met some really interesting people and had some interesting things happen to me. So, um I wrote one chapter, and then I thought I didn't. Re I didn't think of it as a chapter, but I did, wrote the story of like one of my experiences on a movie. And then I thought, you know, maybe I could expand this into a book. So I did something which was very clever at the time. I wrote an outline for myself, and I wrote down each picture that I'd worked on and the little uh, things that I thought were interesting about my experience on that picture, whether it was someone I met, some uh, anecdote, or whether it was some something that I learned or some aesthetic challenge that uh, posed a problem and how we solved it, you know. So I made this outline of things I wanted to write about. And then um, I, chipped at, I chipped away at it um, over the next several, you know, over the next, I would say, 18 years. I didn't finish the first draft till the summer of 2017. And um, I would work on it, you know, and then at times, if I got busy, I would drop it for two or three years at a time. And uh, then when work got slow, I'd sometimes, you know, sort of drift back to it and pick it up again. And as the years went by, um, my periods of employment grew shorter and my periods of unemployment grew longer. So I was able to devote more and more time to it and uh, eventually finished the first draft a little over two years ago. All right. Well, Paul Hirsch, thank you very much for your time. Uh, it was a very interesting conversation. Uh, what do you have planned for the year 2020 before I let you go? Uh, um, nothing really planned. I uh, hope to do a little traveling, but uh, nothing, nothing solid yet. All right. Well, uh, I encourage everyone to pick up your book, A Long Time Ago in a Cutting Room Far, Far Away. Because I've been, you know, very interested in hearing what you have to say. You've worked with some of the greats on some of the great projects. And, you know, good for you, man. Thank you. Okay. Well, take care. All right. Very kind. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.